So who's up next? That is Jason. Oh, yeah. Oh, That's okay, Mark. You can come up and you can help him no, if you like. So Jason Lee is going to talk about compartment syndrome. So I think that gets more entertaining every year, John. Um, <laughs> all right, I was going to talk about compartment uh, syndrome. This is a, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a case. Um, this is a case when I was a resident. Um, this is why you don't get out on the freeway, certainly uh, uh, to uh, deal with fixing your own car. Um, and anyways, he got out and some car behind tried to stop to help him and slammed, slammed him into his own car. Uh, usual sort of uh, workup and uh, pretty obvious um, displaced femur fracture that you could see uh, on, uh, on physical exam and on plane film. We actually got involved, uh, you know, related to, um, related to a pulseless uh, uh, leg. You can go through all the algorithms for deciding, do you uh, replace the fracture first? You put it in the splint, you try to restore flow. There's likely a vascular injury, depending on the institution that you're at. It uh, depends on the timing of each of these things. Uh, many times uh, the orthopedist uh, will uh, kind of temporarily um, reduce it so you can temporarily uh, do some sort of re, uh, revask and then you let them do their permanent uh, fix and then you can do the permanent revask. So we wound up uh, eventually uh, placing a little interposition uh, graft into here. And so what you're left with after sort of several hours of going back and forth and debating and dealing with orthopedics is um, the rest of the um, the rest of the leg. This this actually was an abrasion over the distal calf, and uh, so basically a fasciotomy incision was made already. Um, but perhaps what's more challenging is when the uh, calf is um, when the calf is um, uh, not exposed, and sort of the decision to do some sort of fasciotomy. So so I was always taught if you think about doing a fasciotomy, you may as well do it. And I, I think that, that that has some truth to it, but. But for those who have been in the OR with me, I, you know, I kind of think about this pretty often about trying to potentially save from doing it because there is some small amount of mor you know, morbidity with it. So compartment syndrome defined as increased tissue pressure contained in a non-expensile space that winds up eventually uh, leading to this cascade of uh, decreased capillary perfusion. Obviously, it's after some sort of acute injury in the closed space or uh, some sort of ischemia when then there's um, a delayed revask. Um, untreated obviously leads to significant limb dysfunction and can occur besides in the legs and many other uh, beds. Certainly a lot of literature has been written about abdominal compartment syndrome after ruptured aneurysms and that's something you should all uh, keep in mind. And certainly epidural uh, compartments, uh, closed head injury, and then uh, the, only, the only emergency in ophthalmology, um, glaucoma. Uh, Volkman's contracture, that was the first sort of description of this, um, after tight bandaging after an elbow fracture reduction uh, led to significant arterial insufficiency and massive venous stasis, and that's the, kind of the classic uh, uh, wrist drop uh, that uh, folks uh, will get after that. So the tissue volume is increasing because of some pathophysiology. The available tissue space for it to take this edema or swelling is decreasing. And so obviously it can fill up with blood, pus, uh, fluid, and or you, know, and or you, can, you can cause it um, uh, uh, from a tight bandage, uh, certainly in a burn patient or something like that. Uh, this leads to this uh, cycle of uh, problems with ischemia, reperfusion, uh, certainly these days, uh, wherever institution that you're at, one of the things we've recognized as we've all been interested in doing sort of complex, complex aortic reconstructions, you have these giant sheaths in both femorals and lo and behold, you can spend hours doing some complex branch thoracoabdominal and then when you take the sheets down because you had 20 French sheets in both groins, uh, you can have significant lower extremity perfusion issues. This all leads to sort of excess fluid, uh, fluid formation uh, down there, and the response is really based on how much muscle mass they had previously. Now, a little tiny old lady without a lot of 
leg muscle mass is unlikely to get compartment syndrome uh, because of the lack of the, the lack of the reperfusion problem. So this cycle that you get with capillary pressure, fluid, uh, uh, fluid and leading to increasing compartmental pressure. So if we separate out the etiologies, uh, decreased volume, which is when you purposely close a fascial defect or if you apply too much traction. If the compartment has increased volume of something, so again, bleeding, vascular injury, reperfusion, a crush, contusion injury, um, there are folks that excessively uh, work out uh, that can develop compartment syndrome or excessively run or exercise. Uh, patients who seize can do this. A burn injury is classic uh, for this. Um, intraarterial drug injection, you can obviously close off a compartment. Uh, cold and then re, uh, re-warming and then occasionally shows up on your on your, on your uh, V site and stuff, things related to snake bite, which there are literally chapters in our book, uh, books about this. Externally applied pressure, I think uh, this is getting better and better, but you still have to watch out for if the nurses or if the cast tech uh, puts on a splint or dressing too tight. Uh, we've taken care of patients, homeless patients who have been laying on their arm all night long and they wake up and they realize during the reperfusion part of their arm, they have a compartment syndrome. Uh, the clinical presentation, usually first, um, the tissues most uh, sensitive to it are fine touch uh, fibers, so numbness or a feeling of tingling there. Um, this results first in paresthesias, um, uh, certainly for uh, limbs that are uh, not getting um, fed for about two hours. And then obviously if this um, is prolonged, uh, you get muscle dysfunction, skin changes are kind of the last thing to go. So the visible part of it is the last thing to go, which highlights the importance of actually examining your patient. Uh, bone changes are probably the least, um, uh, 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 the last thing to go. So these tense uh, muscle, uh, muscle compartments, actually feeling the leg leads to uh, some discomfort and pain. So it's tender, uh, passive flexion and extension, meaning uh, uh, um, uh, uh, that there's, that there's uh, significant uh, swelling and pressure that you can kind of feel in there. Um, this is a good slide for sort of remembering number of compartments. In the calf, it's four. The thigh, it's two. Uh, the foot actually has 10 compartments. We do kind of generally uh, leave that up to uh, perhaps sometimes orthopedists to help. Uh, uh, in, the, in the hand and fingers, there's, there's two in the hand, eight in the fingers two in the forearm. If you've actually uh, done some arm fasciotomy releases, usually we kind of involve the, the hand plastic surgeons to come help us with that. They wind up doing a lot of pie crusting of these little finger compartments um, when there is true upper extremity compartment syndrome. I think for us, the thing that we need to uh, know and understand is uh, the relationship of where these uh, muscles are in the, in the anterior and lateral compartment. Uh, I think uh, uh, hopefully uh, folks have done enough of these to understand for this, for this anterolateral incision, you have to see this septum that separates the, the anterior and lateral compartments. Probably the most common, um, the most common error on that anteromedial or on the, uh, on the anterolateral incision is uh, mistaking this septum and uh, leaving basically the lateral compartment um, un, uh, uh, um, you know, unopened. The posterior incision is usually a little bit easier to deal with because you see the gastroc and the superficial and you just have to dive deep enough into either the side of it or right through the muscle to get to the fascia, to get to the deep, uh, to get to the deep layer, to get to the deep posterior compartment. Uh, what are the muscles and nerves involved? This is a chart to remember for things like the V-site and stuff. Uh, I think the anterior compartment um, is important because the deep perineal nerve and uh, for those uh, for the for the fellows in the room that have obviously evaluated trauma patients you know feeling that uh, first uh, web space uh, between the first and second toe is is a sensory area for that deep perineal nerve so that's how the the anterior compartment tends to be affected most obviously they have difficulty um, uh, dorsiflexing uh, their uh, their toes because of tibialis anterior and this extensor digitorum longus um, uh, for that. So that's kind of an important one in trauma to remember that's the first one to go. Uh, the lateral one has a superficial perineal nerve, again, some paresthesias along the distal uh, anterior part of the um, shin. And then again, these uh, superficial and deep posterior for the leg. Uh, this is a random number generator. It's the striker. Um, <laughs> The, the striker test uh, thing. Uh, you can order it at the ICU. Um, 
I think if you, if you should get one and try it um, on the next patient you have in the ICU that won't know any better if you stick a large needle in them. Um, and I bet any, you know, everybody on the team will wind up getting a different number. People talk about measuring um, you know, that something above 30 is potentially, is potentially dangerous. Again, I think it just depends on how hard you infuse the fluid and you can get it to read what you want it to read. Uh, so again, these incisions are uh, made in order to gain access to the superficial and deep posterior compartment. And then here you need to see the septum that separates the anterior and lateral compartments. Um, I don't know who made this first set of slides. These got to be pictures from the 60s when there was only black and white. Uh, these are giant incisions for fasciotomy. I guess if you're dealing with limb reperfusion or limb salvage, I don't think any incision is too small. but. I, you know, I do a lot of popteal or functional popteal entrapment for some of our athletes uh, in the Bay Area too. I think if I made incisions like this, that practice would surely close down. Um, there are some pretty fancy ways to do fasciotomy incisions. There's some local orthopedists and some podiatrists that are doing these minimally invasively for that specific, for chronic compartment syndrome that's more athletic. I think obviously in a trauma situation, uh, you need to be able to see that you got the fascia and that the muscle uh, is relieved of its uh, discomfort. These are some nicer netter, these are some nicer netter descriptions. Again, probably an incision a little bit on the longer uh, side, but again, highlighting the idea that opening up these fascia allow everything to kind of open up and to be able to visualize these things. I like to be able to look and comment on the color of the muscle, the presence of arterial bleeding, and I think although it's, it's a little bit um, inconsistent. I think if the muscle jumps to electrocautery, I generally find that as a good sign. Uh, these days, everybody's managed by ICU teams now. Uh, uh, this, uh, about a month ago, I had somebody that I did fasciotomy on that then uh, I went back to the bedside an hour later and the urine was Coca-Cola colored and I started waxing about that. And uh, whoever the ICU resident, who I think was an anesthesia R2, just looked at me like I, 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 that I made something up when I said that the urine looked like Coca-Cola. And so that's obviously myoglobin in there. I started talking about mannitol and Lasix, and they thought I was talking about just trying to keep, keep the CVP under control, when actually what this does is it flushes out some of the oxygen-free radicals that develop because of reperfusion. So you can alkalinize by using a bicarb drip. <laughs> Perhaps some of this is in the ICU literature. Maybe, maybe I've just not kept up with it, but when I started spouting all these things, literally the ICU attending um, uh, looked at me like I was uh, speaking gibberish uh, about uh, these things. Could be because I keep giving this talk for the last 10 years. <laughs> so, um, so again, these are where the incisions are. Uh, if it's, if it's Trump, you can see here that clearly the fascia is now taken and then it's, it has spread out very nicely. Wound management, a lot of different biases towards this. Uh, uh, where, you know, where we are, all of my other partners like to put these rubber bands on there. I, I, you know, I actually just like to put a wound vac on it. I think that's the, the cleanest, simplest approach to it. Uh, and then um, you can take down the wound vac whenever you want. Uh, and uh, definitely all of them need a primary uh, uh, or, or a secondary closure, generally with a skin flap, more on the lateral side. The medial side, often you can wind up uh, closing over time. I get the plastic surgeons involved to help with wound management. So got to recognize it early. If you think about it, you probably wind up needing to do it. You need to release all four compartments. You need to, really, the key thing for that lateral incision is seeing that septum so you know you're in the anterior and lateral. Debride necrotic muscle and deal with the wound. Thanks.